this is what our uh, fellowship program looks like uh, it finds individual scientists and phd is uh, a prerequisite to apply for any of our basic biomedical schemes for clinical and public health research an md or md phd or any other equivalent degree is the basic requirement we provide grants and fellowships to scientists as, at different stages of their career starting from early career fellowship for postdocs who plan to pursue a career in science and are looking for funding opportunities for an independent research position to intermediate fellowships for scientists who plan to set up an independent research group and then we also have senior fellowships for established researchers who plan to expand their research programs in india uh, our next uh, call for application will be launched uh, next year we also have other uh, funding opportunities grants like team science grants clinical and public health centers research management institutional grants and fellowships you can find all the details on our website www.indialliance.org Uh, a small announcement before we move to our last session we will be issuing the e certificates to all those who attend the entire workshop but it might take us 5 to 7 days to issue these certificates but you will receive your certificates so with that i would like to invite my colleague uh, dr rahul datta who is a grants advisor at india alliance to steer the next session which is on careers in veterinary and animal sciences and rahul will be sharing networking tips on how to craft a career in veterinary and animal sciences uh, i welcome you rahul over to you yeah thanks uh, yukti for the forum uh, so now that we know how to write a very solid uh, manuscript and how to conduct uh, ethical research the next step would be to enhance the career by after publishing the paper one way to look at it is that there is a african proverb that says if you want to go fast go alone if you want to go far go together so it brings the you know uh, essence is that there should be collaboration and now research is becoming more and more interdisciplinary that's why we need collaboration and believe in essentially effective collaboration can be a good way to enhance our career so this next session will be something that will deal with that issue and uh, um, of course my name is uh, dr rahul datta i am a veterinarian uh, uh, i did uh, uh, my graduation from assam and then i am an alumni of uh, national dairy research institute i have a phd from germany and followed by a post doctoral stint at hebrew university of jerusalem now i am a full time grants advisor i am into research management so today's session would be about how to build effective co research collaboration how to um, use the power of scientific networking to enhance your career yeah please feel free to ask questions and please engage let's so the topic would be science networking key to building a, uh, an effective research collaboration and career for those who are looking to build a, you know go for further research and uh, do their phd's there are students here uh, this could be of use and those uh, seasoned researchers who are willing to build uh, effective collaboration that and this could be of use also so the first question that uh, while uh, trying to find the right collaborator the first question should be what is the area of interest that i'm uh, willing to work on this is the uh, question that should come to your mind first while deciding the area of interest of course there could be something that you are really fascinated about but other relevant factors would be how do you see the trajectory of research evolving in over say next 5 10 years how do you see the funding scenario evolving in that uh, research um, for example you want to do some research on say proteomics uh, profiling of uh, say liquid bioassay to detect um, markers for cancer do you see that field attracting a lot of funding in next 5 10 years do you see Uh, this technique evolving over five ten years, and how is it going to influ uh, influence your career as a uh, career over this period of time? This could be one area of, uh, that you should look into. This could be a criteria for selecting what should be the area of your interest. So, 
next once you identify this it is always good to have a draft research proposal ready um, what it does is that uh, you are you would be communicating with a lot of researchers collaborators to uh, uh, potential collaborators so always people want to know what exactly do you think about the scientific proposal what kind of questions are you raising so it is always good to have a brief idea what you want to do it should essentially should not be something that uh, it should not be the entire proposal of 5000 words what i mean is a uh, say 1000 words i am not restricting the uh, word limit here but should be something uh, that should be your first uh, point of communication first uh, connect to the person you are writing to and of course uh, uh, you know it's a competitive world here you, you know a very influential scientist probably will get 30 40 even 100 uh, requests for collaborations or hundreds uh, requests from students to accept them into their uh, lab so think about it so uh, the uh, competition is too high so you have to think um, may, it may not uh, work in your favor if you stick to one lab and then uh, pray to god that this might uh, this should work but it doesn't work like that so it is always good to um, you know distribute uh, not to put your eggs uh, in one nest it is always uh, uh, good to find a few choices and then uh, go in a strategic manner and of course uh, where do you want to conduct the research you see as long as you are in india uh, there is no geographical restrictions you can move uh, freely but then if you want to go uh, to some other countries then uh, that uh, the considerations that you uh, should take into account before choosing the destinations there could be like immigration restriction here can i go to that country freely what should be the uh, restrictions there in place what could be the financial situation in that country what is the funding scenario like if uh, someone uh, a young researcher want to stay beyond a stipulated period of say three years uh, of a phd in that country is there is the government policies permissive to uh, attain residentship permanent residentship or citizenship in this country these could be different uh, factors that uh, sh should be taken into account uh, while choosing or ch shortlisting the country of your choice uh, but uh, coming to that point even india uh, as a research funding agency point of view the quality of research uh, being conducted in india is increased uh, has increased manifold we see great publications coming from our funded research please go through our fellows profile also they could be really good collaborators uh, who are already doing excellent world-class research within the cohort of india alliance funded project so do go through our website to locate those um, and of course uh, identifying the in uh, the admission requirements what are the requirements for going to those you uh, know universities or countries there could be some requirements uh, like english language requirement or uh, some university level requirement like uh, gre TOEFL is an english level requirement and uh, for, for funding within india uh, there are requirements like net jrf and uh, iits have gait for example so these uh, it is essential to make sure that you qualify those and uh, for example Let's take the example of TOEFL, for example. Uh, it's an English, uh, uh, mandatory English re requirement. But then uh, sometimes uh, uh, doing an undergrad and postgrad uh, totally in English will uh, probably make you eligible to apply for it. But it doesn't harm to have that kind of a qualification because the experience uh, that you gather through preparing for these and, uh, exams, that it's that could be also uh, really gratifying and that could be very influential uh, towards you, uh, developing your career. And then finally, I say identifying the funding score, uh, options. Uh, this could be short term grants also. Sure. This could be long term fellow scholarships also. If you are planning to do, say, a postdoc or a PhD, it should be a scholarship looking at uh, three to four years of funding. Or if there are a researcher who wants to make two, three months of short stay in the lab, I'm sure there are many schemes uh, that DBT, DSP, ICMR, UCC is running that allows for those. So you need to figure out the source of funding. And usually 
people uh, in the research fraternity, we tend to get the funding from external sources. It's uh, really the case where individuals go on uh, self-finance uh, tools like that. So these are the qualification. When I list uh, the items, these are not in specific orders. These are important criteria. These are point, pointers that you can look into. Yes. So coming to the central point, we are looking for a good collaborators and where should we look for? The world is vast and even cyberspace is vast. So, so we have to refine our searches and go about first uh, in a sequential and strategic manner because the competition out there is very tough, like I said. So the first point where you can start looking is scientific databases that you are familiar with. Could be a PubMed, could be a Scopus, could be Science Direct, could be a Research Gate uh, play, uh, you know, profile. These actually let you go through. Uh, if you, for example, type a keyword, say single cell sequencing, so that keyword will pull a lot of publications. Then you can figure out the prominent researchers or researchers that, that fits your bill and then make a list out of it and see if these researchers are the one that you want to collaborate with. Another best way I feel is going through journal articles or even textbooks. So through the journal article, if you read them, there would be a corresponding author email ID. You can definitely write to that person if the paper is of a, your interest area or is uh, something that you want to work with or collaborate with, with you definitely can engage. This is a very, so, uh, it's a proven and very robust way of interacting with somebody, uh, citing the paper and then giving a critical feedback about the work that works uh, very effectively. It may not be a hundred percent success rate, but it is a very efficient way. I had myself used those to, while I was searching for my collaborators in the past. So this uh, always works. The traditional ways, university websites and academic profile, most of the uh, universities from, of the West uh, have a proper university websites and the academic profiles or lab profiles are very well managed. So you can definitely go through those and read through those and learn about the lab, the kind of people are uh, working on there, what kind of publications they do, the environment of the lab. These are informations that would, even Indian labs uh, nowadays, uh, most of the prominent uh, Institute of National Repute have uh, really well managed website. You can go and read about this. Even if they do not have proper websites, many of the researchers, most of them nowadays have or seed profile or research gate profile or other kind of profile which are indicative of the kind of research they are doing so this could be one area uh, resource that you can tap into and then there are project listing databases uh, i will talk about them later essentially these are like job posting that uh, for example indian context dbt fellowship uh, requires a jrf for this kind of uh, requirement listing would be there these Platforms can be used very efficiently to look at the kind of openings um, that are available to apply for and the um, kind of research that people are doing. You may not be looking for a PhD postdoc position, but uh, this could be a potential collaborative that is working in a very interesting area of you, uh, that could be working in a synergistic area and would probably you may add something to his research, so his or her research. So it is definitely advisable to you know, um, approach and uh, try to build a uh, collaboration through those. And then academic blogs, many of these uh, uh, modern day researchers, they like to interact with the society through the, the public engagement platform. They, so they write blogs also. So this is a good way for novice researcher who are young. They probably are not familiar with the science the person is doing, but these academic blogs are written in a very general and layman uh, friendly language so people would understand them and uh, it is a good place to look for uh, you know ideas about the research and to understand the research better way if you want to uh, approach a prominent scientist who has an academic blog please read through it to understand more about the person and then approach him or her uh, uh, through a proper channel or uh, in terms of a formal channel. I'm, uh, I should use the formal channel 
of communication. So academic blogs uh, could be a very effective way of reaching out. Yes. So uh, when we talk about scientific networking, we scientists tend to be uh, of the mindset that should we network? Is it a good thing? Uh, why I say it's a necessary evil, or an, uh, is it necessary, or it's a necessary evil? Because you know, traditionally the, the word networking, it will come to your mind a salesperson coming into your lab trying to sell you different chemicals or different kits. So that's the first picture comes to your mind. So um, it's a more of a commercial kind of a. Uh, practice so we tend to look at it as not something that we need to do but then you need to think harder because is it true that we don't need networking and uh, this example that i am giving is the letter written by Sh uh, ramanujan to wh hardy back in 1913 a young clerk from uh, madras writing a letter to a professor abroad uh, uh, giving a critic to his research and asking for possibility of collaboration. That is, what is it? Do you think it is a uh, first step of networking? Yes, it existed from 1913 onwards or probably even uh, earlier also. So networking is essential. This letter, this is freely available in uh, the web. Please access it, read through it. Maybe this um, will change your mindset about scientific networking and probably throw some light that how important uh, this scientific networking is. Probably if this letter was not written, we would not have uh, seen such a great mathematician. You know, this is crucial. So scientific networking is important. It is necessary. Even if you don't like it, I would say that it is a very essential transferable skill that uh, modern day researchers uh, be it animal science or veterinary science or be it a general researcher from any field, this is a very important tool to have in your kit. Yeah. So now we are mostly working in an online situation because the COVID pandemic has forced us into it. But even before that, the cyberspace is massive, you know, building uh, this situation will be like this for a foreseeable future. So even without this situation, the cyberspace is a gold mine of information. We need to know how to, where to look for it. First, while planning to cultivate a relationship uh, of uh, say future uh, important collaboration, we need to know where to first look for it. So I said the most daunting task is to figure out where to start. It's a massive cyberspace there. Uh, gigabytes of data are available. Where do I search even? So the first basic step, uh, it's common sense. It's not uh, rocket science or something. First, find out where they hang out and then start hanging out yourself. So there are many websites which are specially designed for like-minded people or uh, professionals to mingle together. For example, ResearchGate, many of you already have these web, um, accounts there. So it is meant for researchers. Say, it's uh, you want to hang out with uh, scientists or you want to interact with scientists. So logically, you need to see where uh, am I supposed to get those uh, these kind of people together. It's definitely uh, not Instagram. Uh, uh, it's definitely not going to be something else. So. The first thing is to know where to search. And the second strategy would be to find, look for places where you are more, most likely to find these people and then uh, interacting with them. I bring in LinkedIn into this account because this is the, uh, the most prominent professional social networking site. At the same time, I also will like to mention about Twitter. These are two platforms that I have seen and used personally to uh, build some very influential uh, collaboration, which are effective even today. And I have seen uh, a lot of people, even my acquaintances, my students, who have built really good collaboration over these platforms. So please understand the the uh, the massive reach of these platforms, which are available, and try to utilize those. Yeah, I'm not. Uh, promoting a certain brand, but I am trying to say the uh, I am trying to emphasize the uh, potential of the cyberspace 
and connecting people through the cyberspace in advancing your career. And definitely there are online peer communities. You know, a lot of us use the WhatsApp group. So I know of groups where people share job postings, uh, even research openings. So you can be part of those also. You can be part of a Facebook community that um, you know, sh um, you know shares uh, relevant research related updates, uh, position related updates. But uh, the is uh, essential uh, underlying point is that please try to cultivate the connections uh, in the cyber, uh, cyberspace using a certain strategy. This is what I am trying to tell. So once you have figured out the person to connect and the lab to go to or the collaborator you want to uh, engage with the uh, taking a step back i would like to emphasize that the competition is enough uh, enormous while i was in uh, germany my lab supervisor dr schnicke used to get 30 to 40 emails requesting how to collaborate or take people as students or postdocs so Think about it. This is the same situation everywhere. People get bombarded with a lot of, uh, you know, uh, emails and CVs. So the first thing is to make a good first impression. You know, how do you do this? There, it's not a rocket science again, but certain steps, taking care of certain points can help you stand out in the crowd. First is memorability. In terms of um, think, uh, think it as an advertisement that comes for say five seconds and it creates a sort of a bang and then it's registered in your mind. So it's called stickiness of your idea. So in, in this case, stickiness of your own profile. So how do you present this? So you have to make sure that you somehow cater or tweak your, you know, uh, first approach in such a way that it will uh, make a lasting impression and second point is say it simply because you do not have a lot of time you know people usually scan through the email for uh, maybe 30 seconds at the max and then they decide what to do with it so you need to use some languages which is not excessively flowery or too technical now coming to this point we from the Asian the Southeast Asian region we people are uh, known to be very polite and uh, directness in our conversation is not something that comes naturally to us because of our cultural upbringing we like to be very you know humble and polite to you but sometimes uh, this may look very indirect to people people may uh, from different countries or different cultures or or people who are essentially very busy may not be looking for that. They want to know a CTA that is call to action, what exactly the person is looking for. So you need to find a sweet spot of being direct and not looking too pushy. So it has to be a blend of both. Politeness, at the same time, you know how to be direct and uh, in your ask. So this is very important. And uh, the third point is be unique. What is your USP? Uh, normally, we get a lot of letters or emails uh, which are essentially uh, filled with generic lines and these are essentially carbon copy of uh, statements of purposes so somebody wrote it uh, five years ago and this has been running in the lab for said so this is not the right way they probably this will not create the right impression and that will not be uh, seen as that this guy is unique I, and so uh, invest some time in catering uh, uh, or crafting your own uh, SOP. We call it uh, SOP, those unfamiliar with it, it's called statement of purpose. Essentially, it's a cover letter. And uh, it could be in the form of an email also, how to draft it. So this is important. So next point would be to, sorry, so how to, uh, email a potential collaborator now that uh, most often than not you need to reach out the, uh, to the potential collaborator the probably uh, majority of the cases it is through uh, an email and uh, there are ways to get uh, the adequate attention the kind of response that you want from the person uh, through your email it has to be crafted in such a way that 
you get a favorable response from my own personal experience i tell you that uh, the, uh, someone trying to build a international collaboration it might take more than 1000 emails to get even 10 positive responses then the workable leads that eventually gets into uh, a fruitful collaboration so this is the kind of ratio of success so you want to improve the ratio of your success or hit rate so you need to uh, curate your email accordingly and uh, the first i say the email would be the first handshake that goes from your side to a collaborator who, no matter where uh, geographically the person is located so first thing would be to make a connection make a connection means uh, just imagine a situation if you know a collaborator uh, who has worked with your uh, immediate supervisor that is itself a connection there you know somebody who knows the supervisor or the potential collaborator that is a connection but then not always that you will get to that situation you are not lucky to know somebody that knows the really hot shot collaborator here but so making a connection like uh, for example if you say sir i read or oh, sorry uh, I read your paper about this. I think um, uh, this is what is like good about the paper. I have, I have a better suggestion about it. It's a short critique about the you engage about the publication. That could be a connection or a connection about I read your uh, blog and I like this aspect about it. It is a way to connect how the person will like. I said you need to stand out from the crowd uh, in in the uh, you know. Uh, in the traffic of uh, generic emails, you also uh, will stand out because you have established a connection. Have a clear CTA, have a clear call to action. Call to action is in what exactly are you looking to achieve through this conversation? So there are a number of times I have encountered emails where the uh, you read and finish then reread the email, you uh, don't know what exactly the person is asking for. So you need to uh, explain in proper uh, concise way what exactly are you looking for need to be very clear about it introduce yourself of course you need to tell why um, who you are what is your background why you want to do a collaboration or what exactly are you trying to do so introducing yourself keep it short so the time i say is very limited so people usually spend 30 seconds max or maybe one minute so you need to keep it very short not um, a email of like 3000 word that will probably get deleted automatically this is not going to have that kind of impact keep it very brief and concise and direct and have a clear subject line reading through it if you are requesting for a collaboration for a short stay say that request for collaboration for a short duration or if you are requesting for say samples that the person might have or uh, probably you want to learn a technique in a collaborator's lab. So say those things. So you, uh, request for collaboration about a technique. The technique you know, could be facts, for example, could be an in vitro inoculation method that you want to learn. So uh, uh, have a clear subject line so that person can understand oh, what is this email about. So then he or she can decide whether to go ahead with it or uh, do something else about it. So. Uh, that clarity is important and then of course thank them for their time these are very busy person uh, i am sure many of you are researchers running your own lab you guys are busy so the same the other person is so it is always a polite way of uh, concluding an email by thanking them for their valuable time that's uh, these are not in any particular order but i think these um, are key ingredients for writing a first email to a potential collaborators and this is where i have seen many people go wrong at this stage and they complain that they don't don't get enough responses to the emails they send so i have an example for example take this take this email read through it so uh, he uh, could be a potential uh, young students looking for a graduate position or a PhD position. And he writes that he is a student and he is graduating from the school and he is getting in touch to know if there is a position. Probably he has attached a CV also. But 
this is the kind of email that I say, these are instant delete kind of email. Because the first thing that comes to the, super, uh, the professor's mind or collaborator's mind, so what do I do with this kind of email? I want to help, but I don't know. The person is not helping me, uh, you know, creating the uh, right set of uh, environment uh, for helping me, you see? So usually they end up in the junk folder. So the, this get deleted. So when you write this kind of email without giving a proper, you know, briefing about what exactly you are looking, this is, where majority of the emails land up. So the, I call it what to do with these kind of emails or instant delete kind of email. So uh, next would be, for example, take this email and here just uh, spend few minutes reading through it. Uh, so uh, first doctor, uh, dear doctor something, accept my regards, I am somebody a researcher currently pursuing my research in a certain field and I have read your paper on something and I find the paper very innovative and research approach is very good. I, I, am, uh, you, you, I am exploring the possibility of future collaboration with your group. So also the, this is followed by a section why um, this kind of collaboration would be useful for the person and then Again, uh, staying with the connection part of it, uh, if it's the, gonna, uh, the method that the scientist is developing is very uh, relevant and this was discussed in the uh, previous lab meeting of the researcher that uh, is applying for the position. Then also it has a uh, saying, uh, thanks for your time. I, again, reiterating that uh, he is or he, willing to, uh, he's writing to explore future collaboration potential. So why this email is good? Because first of all, the person writing this email has established his own identity first, and then he has established a connect by saying that he has read the paper of, uh, written by the person and uh, he finds the approach very innovative and this was discussed in the lab meeting itself. And then he goes on to elaborate a bit further what is he looking for, uh, from this collaboration. And the call to action is, I'm exploring the possibility of future collaboration. Are you going to fund my uh, application for a certain fellowship? And then end this by, thank, thanks for your time. So if you see, it has a clear call to action, it has a uh, clear, uh, you know, uh, clear connect, and it is brief, it may look long to you, but it is a brief email indeed, and then it thanks. So the person has used freely available resources to investigate the background of, his, of this researcher, and then he has made himself, he has initiated a collaboration. So most likely cases, this kind of emails, uh, in 100% cases, I, no one can guarantee that this will be a, a positive outcome, but it is most likely to get a response even if he uh, is not interested you respond reply that no i don't have positions in my lab or i'm not interested to co collaborate but uh, this is an email that i uh, wrote uh, when i was in uh, graduate school i uh, collaborated with this guy and applied for a jsps fellowship and so uh, i can say that this kind of email works because i used it many a times and most of the time i got responses so now staying with the networking part of it, uh, the importance of networking and importance of having a strong LinkedIn presence. You may be thinking why uh, a researcher need this kind of uh, presence. So I am good at my work. I will stay in my lab and uh, publish the best papers. It works. It is uh, one way of doing it, but devoting some upon, uh, some uh, amount of time in creating a good uh, social media presence is very valuable nowadays because people really take care of these and you know they look into your profile and uh, search relevant websites and most predominantly linkedin is a platform that is the most uh, predominant professional 
social media platform or pre, uh, professional interaction site where uh, people of different profession come together and they form a kind of interaction and they are for, uh, forming a community of people uh, so that they can add value to their own careers. So uh, I emphasize that the modern day researcher should invest some time and build a LinkedIn presence. So let's see uh, how do you go about it. First things first. We need a profile picture. Um, if I am coming to your profile, I need to know whom I am conversing, uh, doing the conversation with or whom I am interacting with. So firstly, have a, pro a proper profile picture. You know, the do's would be wear a formal t-shirt uh, or sorry, for formal dress. If it is a business attire, it is even better. But a formal dress is something that is good. Uh, a casual the dress, uh, a photo when you were in Goa doing partying probably is not the best place for, uh, probably LinkedIn is not the best place for that kind of a, this can go to Facebook or Instagram. So have a proper profile picture wearing formal and it is always good to smile. So people like to interact um, with people who are approachable. So a smile makes you more approachable. So. Uh, make sure you smile and then don't block the picture. Don't block your face with an object or uh, maybe shades or uh, it should be uh, well lighted so people can interact with you. Know, knowing whom I am talking to you, uh, knowing whom I am talking to is a first point that people um, will emphasize. Uh, probably they would not like to connect with somebody with a blank screen or black spot or a very unprofessional photograph. So first, these are the do's and the wounds would be no photo. Probably that's not the uh, uh, right thing to do in a profile. If you are in present in the LinkedIn platform, make some time to get a picture taken or if you have a, a good enough picture from a different occasion also, please use it. And then casual photos, like I said, uh, Holiday photo, partying photo probably is not the best place for me. This will show that you are not serious about your um, professional side of your career. So definitely selfies are a big no. You don't uh, take a casual photo again uh, and use it as a, as a uh, profile picture here. But uh, uh, treat this as your online resume or online CV. So th this is the best way to put it in. This is your online presence and this is your online CV. So uh, I'm sure most of you would be very serious about putting best things forward in a while well compiling a CV. Uh, this is one of the first steps of your online CV. That is the profile picture. So I say become a power user. The enormous reach of this platform. There are millions of people. I heard that probably three, four people join this platform every second. And uh, there are enormous quantity of scientists and modern day researchers and uh, young PIs who interact daily on this platform. I uh, am quite active in this platform and I uh, see do, uh, people using this platform to spread their research, lab news and whatnot. And so the best way is to become a, uh, how do you become a power user? So being in LinkedIn is the first step, but then how to optimize that you can build a network that will help you reach your goal in future. First, polish your profile. The pro polishing a profile, you can read tons of freely available material, but the best way is to look for a profile that you know is good one and that is active for a while. Then see how the person, uh, he or she is feeling different sections and how is he going about adding different stories to his billboard kind of thing. So looking at an existing profile is a good way and it's a social media platform so connect as much as you can usually linkedin the algorithm works in a way that the more number of people you connect with your profile get pushed or the, the visibility of the profile uh, it becomes uh, it increases so connect join professional groups of your interests say you are interested in say you are a veterinary microbiologist Also, someone is a surgeon, so animal surgeon, for example. So join a group. So these groups are uh, 
by professionals who are serious about their work and they discuss different case studies, different new findings, advances in technology. So you can definitely build a, a very effective uh, collaboration through this and even, uh, even sitting through those uh, comments or discussions or uh, silently observing them will definitely enhance the knowledge that you have. The best way to make your profile relevant is to optimize the keywords. Say, I have a skill of uh, RNA sequencing, poly, uh, PCR, protein synthesis or whatever, protein uh, purification. So it is relevant that you add these to your profile numerous times. So that if there are groups or there are relevant opportunities that are related to these areas, your profile gets uh, you know, the visibility of your profile increase manifold with these keywords. So it is called keyword optimization. So use these techniques so that the, al the algorithm can pick your profile up and get noticed. You see, many a times I get, get this uh, question, we get this question that uh, the young researcher struggles to get the first break in their career because they do not have enough publications, for example. They oftentimes um, question us, uh, sir, I do not have enough publication, or what do I do about it? But you see, uh, a collaborator not always look for publications to judge a person or a student. This is the aptitude of a person that is being judged here. As a collaborator, probably he or she is not looking for someone with a 10 or 20 publication on a relevant field. If it is a young researcher, nobody expects that, but it is the aptitude that people wants to look. When you join group discussions or give relevant comment, engage meaningfully, that shows that the you know right aptitude is there. With little training, one can learn skills, but aptitude is something that um, you know that you need to uh, work on it and you want, want to build this so this is a right way of you know building that online presence where people will take you seriously that this is a candidate with uh, the right aptitude so another is uh, project yourself as an authority so this is a platform with a tremendous reach you can write a blog about something say uh, a young First year MBSC student of microbiology, he doesn't have public, he or she doesn't have publication, what to do? But no one is stopping anyone from writing a blog about it. It is not peer review content, but a well thought out blog, concise uh, a piece of article about a certain relevant topic that shows that the person can think right. He has the right aptitude to ask the right questions. So it is a platform to build authority people take you seriously people like to connect with these kind of people Wait a yeah so let's uh, go to the next slide at the essence of the whole lecture is building a network, building a scientific network so that you can find the most meaningful collaborations and how to go about it. It is a mindset game. You see, with little practice, this is a transferable skill that you can learn. With little time, you can get the skill and uh, utilize this as the next ladder for your career enhancement just to understand the process, the basic principles are information flows in both direction. So you add value to a conversation, then only you get back what you are looking for. So it has to be a two way process. It cannot be one way that, a, you know, it cannot be a lecture, it has to be a dialogue. So try to engage whoever the person, don't get intimidated by the stature of a person uh, being very senior, very predominant, uh, prominent figure in the field, just try to engage. Even liking an article or a blog or uh, giving a congratulatory message is a way of engagement. So uh, start doing those while you are in a 
in a social media platform. Uh, it doesn't have to be LinkedIn. Even if you read a good piece of article in ResearchGate, it is always uh, possible to write to the author congratulating him or giving a, a critical piece of you know, critique about the article. So that is one way of engaging. So information uh, is Rahul, going sorry through. to interrupt. Can and we first, conclude in two minutes? We are actually running okay, behind the studio. Yes. Oh, sorry. Yeah, sorry. Thank I mean, you. This is the last slide, actually. So focus on what you can do about uh, others. And then it is a continuous process. You learn while you evolve. So, so it, the skills will come to you. So keep practicing, and it is a relevant skill. So these are some funding uh, opportunities that um, we have in India. I'm sure the, our team will share these slides with you. So predominantly, go through these websites if you are interested in continuing your research careers. And many of these uh, Indian funding agencies also are uh, encouraging collaborations as well. So they are supporting international visits also. Uh, at, at the same time, Indian research, um, research in India. So kindly go through this and uh, try to utilize those. And international funding agency, um, I'm listing few of those. Uh, DART could be, a, a, DART is German funding agency, the, the USIEF, that is the one that gives you Fulbright Fellowship, MEX is a German one, and Commonwealth is the UK government funding fellowship, and find PhD and scholarship.coms are two websites that uh, uh, are uh, really prominent web uh, databases where they do job, uh, PhD position or the research opportunity listing, so you can look into it and uh, learn the relevant opportunities available. So I think with this, I will conclude. Hopefully, I have uh, convinced uh, that, uh, you know, networking is important. Uh, just by saying one thing I would like to conclude is, you see, networking is something that happens only after the event, during the follow-up period. It's, what we are doing is probably con connecting at the moment. But the networking will be the follow-up process. So do follow up on the you know key points that we have uh, spoke, uh, spoken in this session, and uh, hopefully we can network also in a different setting. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you, thank you, Rahul. That was an extremely informative session. I'm sure all our attendees you know have benefited from the talk. So with that, one last announcement. Uh, we will be issuing the e-certificates to all of those who have submitted or will be submitting the post-workshop uh, survey form. We will value your feedback. And uh, please note that it will take us five to seven working days to issue the certificate. So uh, you will receive your certificate. And uh, yeah, uh, this brings us to an end. And I would like to thank all of you for joining us today. And please take care and stay safe. Thank you. Thank you.